All right, our next reuse themed speaker is Zenia Dolovova, and she is going to embark on a journey with Furniture Repair Bank, a unique nonprofit effort in the intersection of sustainability, community, and equity. Discover how we re rescue furniture and engage volunteers in scalable repairs and donate those in to those in need. As the pioneering organization with this transformative mission, explore the why, what, and how behind these efforts. Senia. So it's the blue one to advance. Okay. And she's got your timing right there. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really love the sequence of those presentations because when the topic of furniture, broken furniture came up, I'm like, yay. Next. So um, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I think I'm the only speaker from out of state, so I'll try to do it justice. Uh, it's a lot of pressure, but I try to do it well. Um, so my name is Zenia, and I'm a founder and a director of Furniture Repair Bank. Um, just a little bit of a background. We, are, we had a pilot for two years. We learned that we can actually scale furniture restoration. We got a warehouse last June and uh, officially opened last September. But even in the short three, four, five months or two years, we learned a lot of lessons. And today I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, we are at the moment a program of a nonprofit called Zero Waste Washington that's been studying for 40 years. But we are also on a pathway to become our own uh, 501c3 in the next months. And our mission is to build a community of mighty, courageous, and empathic individuals while rescuing furniture from going to the landfill and uh, helping our neighbors in need. And as mentioned, we are working on the interse intersection of sustainability, community, and equity. As you know, there is a lot of furniture that is going to the landfills, millions of it in the United States. Also, as some of you mentioned, uh, furniture restoration skills are generally repair skills are disappearing skills to be a bit more dramatic, dying skills, and they're less and less a past from generation to generation. And of course, we have a, a large community of people in need, whether it's refugees, people getting off homelessness, and many other people who really do, uh, they could benefit from this furniture. And all of that translates into our pillars. Uh, we address those issues by saving furniture from going to the landfill. We are building community resilience through furniture skills, furniture restoration skills, education, and we are helping our neighbors in need. And that translates into our core activities and processes. Uh, so we focus on furniture that no other thrift shops can take. We focus on broken and damaged, worn and outdated furniture. We uh, do redesign and repair by introducing any individual to furniture restoration skills. Uh, so basically we are volunteer powered and everything that we do is volunteer powered. And I will tell a little bit more about that in a second. And we do help um, the most vulnerable of our community members with those furniture. Now a little bit more in depth into all those processes and activities. Furniture collection. I did mention to you that we are very uniquely targeting furniture that cannot go elsewhere. Multiple times our donors say, oh, I try to give it away and buy nothing, but no one wants it. Um, and so we work with exactly that furniture that has no other future. Uh, and we collect it through individuals, through junk haulers, and through organized city collection events. We work with multiple cities in our region, in our area. And, uh, when, of course, we can always extend our partnerships to other organizations as we grow our capacity, as, uh, like in our region, in our area, Goodwill, sorry, they do crash all the furniture that has not been sold within a month and then send it to the landfill. It's really heartbreaking, and we already mentioned colleges, so there is a lot of furniture that we can address as we grow our capacity. And we have some kind of process in place uh, for us to vat all the furniture that comes in ahead of time, so we don't have to deal with rejects at the spot. 
uh, people fill out the form where they mention uh, what's wrong with the item, what is the item, of course, they attach a photo, uh, they tell a story about it, and also we know from what zip code is coming from. And then we respond with saying, yeah, we can work with it, or no, sorry, we cannot. Uh, that's not something that we can take in. Particle board is impossible to repair, unfortunately. Um, and But that also helps us manage our inventory internally because everything is being um, input in the database. Um, yeah, so uh, we kind of create this process on vetting, vetting furniture ahead of time. A fun fact is that donors are actually our most engaged audience of all. In December, we sent out our first newsletter to 400 people and divided the audience by donors, volunteers, and other partners and general public. And donors were the most active among our audience. They totally opened our newsletter multiple times. They checked our before and after photos, our impacts, and just generally spent a lot more time in our newsletter than anyone else which is, that was great. It was very interesting. Uh, if there is a question appears, who else we want to work with, we do want to work with individuals who already want to divert that furniture from the landfill. That's our target audience for now. On the repair and redesign, this is the majority of our work because we cannot do it without volunteers. We cannot do it if they don't know what they're doing. And this is 95% of people. When they come in, they have no prior experience or uh, exposure to furniture restoration at all. But I bet 95% of you will be actually successful and capable of restoring a furniture item that we receive. And we do it through our regular volunteer days. Actually, Monday is our regular volunteer day. We now have a group of like 10 people who come every Monday. Uh, we also uh, run team building experiences. We offer very engaging, very impactful way for teams to come together. Uh, we divide them into smaller groups of five to eight, sometimes 10, and teach them a particular uh, type of restoration skill. Uh, we also are now deploying a program that we built on top of Master Composter. If you're not familiar, basically we're training the trainers. We are training volunteers to train other volunteers, and this way we'll be able to scale that even further. Because at the moment, I'm staying on the floor and showing how people how to send. Um, we also will roll out paid classes. At the moment, we are collecting data. What's the most interesting to people? They're ready to pay for. Actually, project-based is uh, that's what's the most attractive so far for people. They want to come with their own chair and learn, learn how to do it from beginning to the end. Uh, we also have support from BCU Bank this year to roll out a workforce development component. We'll have some funds to train 10 refugee women in furniture restoration skills and employ them. And finally, we also have support, uh, a grant from uh, Micro Enterprise Association to support furniture flippers and small businesses building on our previous experience and network um, to support with them with technical assistance and this way to keep even more furniture out of landfill. And those are the th three main uh, activities that we have. We sand, machine hand sanding, paint, uh, stain, and then do small rape hostry. Basically, we cover everything that we need uh, in terms of furniture restoration. And we do have fixed, uh, fixed, sorry, skilled fixers who do know what they're doing, so they work on our functional uh, structural uh, fixes. And of course, we, we work with the agencies, resettlement agencies, integration networks who help refugees even beyond 90 days. We work with shelters for their, for, to support uh, neighbors who are getting out of homelessness. We work with other entities who support um, women fleeing domestic violence and other um, women in need. Um, and we do try to collect as much data as possible. Of course, we know everything that is getting, out, getting in and out and everything what's in between, and we totally collect all the data, how much stuff we uh, restore. Uh, in terms of weight, we average it. We don't weight each and every item. Uh, you can ask me later how we calculate greenhouse gas emission reductions. And of course, we do track all the volunteer hours. Fun fact that a, like an average furniture item will require about five hours of work on it. And at the moment, we are grant funded. Uh, we are, as we are becoming our own nonprofit, we have a pretty strong fundraising plan. It's a plan for now, but we are planning to roll it out. 
Uh, I mentioned to you corporate uh, team building activities. Uh, some corporations are pretty generous. We are situated right across uh, Starbucks headquarters, and uh, for every hour, uh, for every volunteer, they pay $15 to a nonprofit when uh, their employees come and volunteer. Um, and last week, we had a team from Microsoft, 24 people for hours, and we got $2,400 because they pay $25 an hour. Uh, very generous, but this way we actually can scale and also bring some revenues um, to the nonprofit. Um, on, on here, we, this year we're also planning to roll out our furniture rental service. At the moment in our area, we have a gap in the market. Home staging industry has only one competitor who rents uh, furniture to home stagers industry. So we are planning to get in the market with the help of our advisors. Uh, but this way we'll be actually able to control inventory and always keep that furniture in circulation. And that what's not bringing more money, we can allocate to families. Um, and of course I mentioned paid, I didn't mention paid classes. Yeah, I did. So yeah, I, would, I did. So yeah, oh, this way we'll also bring some revenues in. And for the furniture that is not suitable for families or for rental service, we'll have, we'll re redesign in a very funky way and have a fundraising pop-up shops. That is it. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm open to questions. Am yes, I? we're yeah. open for questions. So wave at me when you've got questions, because we have folks here that right here. Oh, there's a question back here. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. Just a second. Just a second. Talk oh. into the microphone. Wow, a microphone. Two quick questions. Would you accept a fraternity couch? <laughs> Um, we do ask when people want to donate us couches, we do ask them to have no nasty stains, hair, or pennies on the cushions. We had that experience. We don't want to experience it again. She had another question. And last question. So I'm involved in the cat rescue local community, and cat urine on furniture and destroying furniture is a big problem. Lovely antiques, etc. Is that a lost cause? Uh, lovely antiques. Uh, all depends on what state it is uh, in. Um, we can... Cat urine. Cat urine. Uh, <laughs> very good question. If you're very upfront with it, we'll probably tell you no. Uh, if especially if it goes through the through the uh, foam and all of that. For some items, we do re remove the foam and bring a new one. For the couch, it's a lot. We'll probably only bear a cost of $300 in foam alone. So probably it's just not, uh, not worth it for anyone uh, to rescue that particular item. And probably we can allocate those resources and rescue 10 more other items with those resources. Yeah, we've got a question over here. I was wondering, um, first of all, you might want to contact some of the folks that do a lot of sewing and a lot of people might have leftovers. That'd be great, because I'm like one of those, and I'll be downsizing real soon. But I was wondering, when a sofa comes in and it's in great shape, how do you kill the pathogens in it? Very good question. Um, we do uh, like steam cleaning machines and other ways to disinfect it. A question on bed bugs is always up, but that's something uh, that we haven't encountered. There is like a different AV. I, not UV solutions <laughs> and because we do work with our individual donors usually they're pretty diligent and being upfront what's wrong with that particular item um, but when we work on items we also we try to uh, use all the PPEs and clear up the air uh, we have a pretty robust safety instructions uh, for for when we work with disassembling and working on uh, items I hope I answered your questions yeah. uh, Laurentine has a question um, how are you planning to replicate your program? Ah, such a good question, because we are potentially not very much scalable in a single uh, location because we are so heavily dependent on volunteers and they only are ready to travel 30 minutes to our location. So we would replicate similar one an hour away, but it also should be around a larger community when you would have all those resources and volunteers and so on. So we are at the moment a very transparent Two days ago, I had a conversation with Pennsylvania. They have a furniture bank and they want to establish a repair program, which they have to learn how to actually have an inventory management because repair banks and not always have that 
in place. Um, so uh, it's very much replicable and it will like how the way you will make money will be different from every geography, but uh, we are building a paper that will totally can pass on to any other organization municipality that if they want to implement something similar, because it's not a rocket science. It's just get to know your community, really build strong ties with them and just roll on. And just roll. I love it. David, do you have any questions from online? No questions from online. Any other questions? Oh, we've got one right here. Can we have a microphone here in the front row, please? Is there a microphone in the front row? Okay, just shout it out. Oh, here it comes. Vetting process. Thank you. How has your vetting process dealt with the rise of like fast furniture from like IKEA that isn't meant to be replaced or restored? Spot on. Uh, I'm like very hopeful and very optimistic person myself. And sim similar as Freya, I have my eyes and my heart and I'm like, we can save this dresser that is totally water damaged and nothing you can do about it. So we are uh, starting to exclude water damaged IKEA furniture, particle board furniture, uh, because it's just not worth it. It's going to be five hours of something trying to rescue while we can totally put those hours into a solid wood dresser and have a better result and it will stay in circulation for longer. Uh, yeah, so we just we try to rely on items uh, on the photos that people uh, submit and uh, on description. And when you have experience, you're like, oh, I have a feeling this is uh, not what they're trying to sell you. But yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Nicely done.